Welcome back. In our last session, we examined the first half of the Passion narrative, including the Gethsemane scene and the arrest of Jesus by Judas and the arrest party sent from the Sanhedrin. We then looked at the narrative of Peter's denial of Jesus and the hearing before the Sanhedrin in the early morning of that first Good Friday. We concluded with the mocking by the soldiers and the transfer to Pilate. In our current session, we shall conclude the narrative of Jesus' last days, looking at the interrogation, the interrogation before Herod Antipas, the sentencing by Pilate with the Barabbas scene. This will lead, lead naturally to the way of the cross, or the Via Dolorosa, and finally, we shall examine the narrative of Jesus' crucifixion, death, and burial. The scene picks up on the response of the Jewish leaders to Pilate's finding no crime in Jesus. In particular, Pilate catches the mention of Galilee. As a result, he inquires whether this man in front of him was a Galilean. What's significant about Jesus being a Galilean? It means that Pilate technically does not have jurisdiction in this case. Rather, Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch of Galilee, has jurisdiction. So it becomes a means for Pilate to pass the buck, so to speak. So Pilate discovers, indeed, Jesus is under the jurisdiction of Herod Antipas. As a result, he transfers the case to Herod, sending, him, sending Jesus to him. Luke notes that it was possible for Pilate to transfer the case to Herod because Herod was in Jerusalem at this time, more than likely because of the Feast of Passover. In fact, Herod had a rather large palace on the western edge of the walled city of Jerusalem which is where he more than likely stayed when he was in Jerusalem. It was in this palace that Pilate more than it was to this palace that Pilate more than likely sent Jesus. Note, the encounter between Jesus and Herod is unique to the Gospel of Luke. We don't find it in any of the other Gospels. Here we have a map of Palestine at the time of Christ. Toward the bottom you can see the region of Judea, and to the north the region of Galilee. Judea, along with Samaria, was the territory of the Roman procurator Pontius Pilate. Since the time of Archelaus, son of Herod, Herod the Great that is, who proved inept and was removed from office. The territory of Galilee, Galilee and Perea was given to Herod's son Antipas upon King Herod's death. Hence, Jesus the Galilean would be under the jurisdiction of Herod Antipas. We have here a picture of Herod's palace in Jerusalem as depicted in the model of the city of Jerusalem at the Holy Land Hotel. The palace is toward the bottom of the picture dominated by three towers named for Phizael, Mariamna, and Hippicus. We see these toward the left of the picture. This is the great courtyard of the Herodian palace. On either side are the main buildings of the palace. Upon arrival at the palace of Herod, Jesus is taken into the presence of Herod Antipas, whom we are told was very glad to see him because he had for a long time desired to encounter this Jesus of Nazareth. You will recall that earlier in the Gospel, in the narrative of Herod's opinion of Jesus, the text ends with a note that Herod sought to see Jesus. Here, Luke further adds that Herod's desire was fueled by a further hope that he might witness one of Jesus' miracles, such as he was hearing about from all areas in his territory. 
So Herod questioned Jesus at some length. Literally, he questioned him with sufficient words. But as we have seen before, Jesus does not answer. Some see that as Jesus disdaining the charges as not deserving an answer, as Noland observes. In addition, there are those who see Jesus' silence as a fulfillment of what was spoken of in the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah 53, 7, he says, He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. This is spoken of the suffering servant in Isaiah, whom Jesus is portrayed as a fulfillment of in the Passion narrative. The accusers seemed to follow Jesus throughout the narrative. They were in the Sanhedrin chamber. From there they moved to the Praetorium to voice their accusations to Pilate. And now they seemingly have moved to the palace of Herod to voice their accusations to Herod. As Luke puts it, they vehemently accused him. Yet here were not given any content to their accusations. But it can be presumed that their accusations are similar to the ones that we've seen before. Herod and his soldiers end the session with a show of their power. They treat Jesus with contempt and mock him. Herod did not get what he wanted, and so he mocks Jesus. That contempt extends even to the splendid robe or the gorgeous apparel that Jesus is arrayed in before he's returned to Pilate. It was a further mockery of the royal robes of a king. Seemingly, as had Pilate, Herod finds no cause for serious punishment in Jesus, and so when he's had his fun, he returns Jesus to Pilate. Luke's final comment on the scene was that Pilate and Herod became friends that very day, since before that day they were at enmity with each other. Topping the list was a disgust over the fact that Herod the Great's kingdom had been divided. Each had aspirations of rule of the whole with no division. When Herod sends Jesus back to Pilate, Pilate's forced to render a decision on the fate of Jesus. His loophole to get out of rendering judgment seemingly did not work. When Jesus returns, Pilate summons the accusers, here described as the chief priests and the rulers and the people. Here then we have two groups, the priests and the rulers against Jesus, and the people who have been through this gospel all on Jesus' side. All of these are now summoned by Pilate. Then Pilate reiterates the charges that the leaders have brought against Jesus, perverting the people. For the second time, Pilate declares Jesus' innocence. He has examined Jesus in the presence of the accusers, and now he says, I do not find this man guilty of any of your charges. So Pilate's failure to find any basis for their accusation negates their initial presentation where they begin, we have found. To add insult to injury, Herod examined Jesus and he concurs with Pilate's findings since he returned Jesus to Pilate. Herod is considered a Jewish ruler, and so his opinion should outweigh that of Pilate, who is a Gentile. And so again, Pilate declares Jesus' innocence. Nothing deserving of death has been done by him. So Pilate's going to let Jesus go. But he realizes that simply letting Jesus go will not satisfy this party of accusers. And so, despite his gut feeling of Jesus' innocence, he will discipline him or chastise him by having him scourged. 
The general opinion of commentators is that this is a conciliatory gesture to the Jewish leaders. But discipline will not satisfy the accusing Jewish leaders. They want blood, and more than blood. This brings us to the request for Barabbas, particularly Barabbas's release. Luke does not explain why the Jews might request Barabbas' release, as we find in the other three Gospels. The reason is there was a custom. Whether it be on the part of Pilate or for the sake of the Jews, that Pilate would release one prisoner of the people's choice on the occasion of the celebration of Passover. With that in mind, the Jews now request Barabbas and push further for Jesus' execution. Without any introduction, we hear the leader's response to Pilate's declaration. Away with this man! Release for us Barabbas. In answer to the obvious questions as to who this Barabbas, who is suddenly brought into the narrative, is, Judas, Luke, Luke adds a parenthesis. A man, he was, he was a man, thrown into prison for an insurrection, started in the city, and for murder. In other words, Barabbas is one of a number of insurrectionists who more than likely belonged to a party like the Zealots. The Zealots were those who wanted to eliminate Roman rule. A subset of the Zealots was a group known as the Sicarii. They're known by that name because the name refers to the short swords that they would carry. In Latin, the short sword is a Sicarius. They would, according to Arnold and others, mingle in a crowd during a festival and stab Roman sympathizers with their short sword, concealed under their flowing robes. Curiously, the name Barabbas has at its root the Aramaic word Abba, which, as we have seen, in the per is a personal address of a child to his father, many times translated as Daddy. Bar is the Aramaic connective used to designate a son. Thus, Barabbas literally means the son of the father. Could there be a play on words here? Pilate responds to the cries of the crowd. Luke tells us again that Pilate is still trying to find a way of avoiding, to send, avoiding sending Jesus to the cross. But the crowd will not listen to the opinion of Pilate. Pilate has shouted to the crowd, and the crowd now shouts back what they want. Crucify him! Crucify him! The only thing that will satisfy the crowd, who are seemingly becoming more and more unruly, is the death of Jesus by crucifixion. But Pilate is still not convinced. So a third time he questions the crowd. Why crucify him? What evil has he done? Pilate's question is an attempt to get at why they want Jesus, in whom Pilate can find no evil, worthy of death, crucified. But they want Barabbas, in whom Pilate finds all sorts of evil and crime, to be freed. Pilate continues, I found in him no cause deserving of death. Pilate is convinced of Jesus' innocence. Nevertheless, he continues, having chastised him, I will release him, reiterating his earlier resolve. It seems that Pilate's mind is made up. But this isn't going to satisfy the crowd, which is getting more and more agitated. Luke tells us they were urgent in demanding crucifixion with loud cries. These loud cries were getting louder and louder to the point that they finally convinced Pilate to give them their way. The increased agitation of the crowd has caused two of Pilate's predispositions to kick in. 
He was a pragmatist, more interested in maintaining his own power than in justice for an individual. And second, he had a tendency to capitulate under pressure. So he changes his mind and decides in favor of the leaders that their request be accomplished. He releases Barabbas, who was again described as the man imprisoned for insurrection and murder, whom the leaders had requested. But Jesus, the innocent man, he delivers up to their will, crucifixion. The guilty is released, the innocent is crucified. Pilate has capitulated once again to what has become a mob action. And so begins the Way of the Cross, or the Via Dolorosa. The term Via Dolorosa comes from the Latin for Sorrowful Way. It's the name given to the Way of the Cross as it's walked in the streets of Jerusalem by pilgrims. It begins at the Fortress Antonia, or more particularly the Ecce, Ecce Homo Arch, and wends its way to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The total distance is about 600 meters. Shown here is one of the street signs from the city of Jerusalem marking the Via Dolorosa. Luke omits any reference to scourging as a prelude to the crucifixion. He simply begins, they led him away. The implication is that the Jewish leaders who have gotten their way are leading Jesus to crucifixion. But that cannot be, as the law of the day, as we have seen, says that a sentence handed down by Pilate, the Roman governor, must be executed by the Romans. So those leading him away must be Roman soldiers. The omission of the scourging also leaves, leaves us to ask, why was it necessary then to conscript Simon of Cyrene at the beginning of the walk to Golgotha? Yet Luke notes that they seized one Simon, as he came in from the country and made him carry the cross behind Jesus. It should be noted here that the traditional picture of Jesus carrying the complete cross is incorrect. All that the condemned carries is the cross beam. The uprights are at the place of crucifixion. That cross beam is laid on the back of the person's neck and he carries it with his arms wrapped around it. This is a very precarious position, and in the narrow streets of Jerusalem can lead the person carrying it to fall easily. Luke notes that a great multitude followed Jesus as he walked to Golgotha. Possibly they were curious onlookers, but Luke's specific designation of them as people and women mourning and lamenting shows that they are sympathetic to Jesus. The use of the specific term people serves to distinguish this group from those who called for Jesus' execution, the leadership, that is, the chief priests and the scribes. Seeing the reaction of the women, Jesus stops and addresses the women saying, Daughters of Jerusalem. Marshall sees these women as local inhabitants of Jerusalem who witness executions and provide opiates for the condemned man. In a prophetic utterance, Jesus tells them, Weep not for me, but for yourselves and for your children. Jesus is going to his fate, and that is sealed. However, they will have difficult times and difficult days ahead, times of war and times of suffering. Perhaps Jesus is making a veiled reference to the Jewish war, when the city of Jerusalem will be taken by the Romans and destroyed around the year 70. That's truly a cause for weeping. His next statement seems to confirm that thought. Behold, days are coming, when they will say, A time is coming when it will be better for the children not to be born than see the sufferings that they will be born into. Barrenness was considered a reproach for a woman. Yet here Jesus declares that the barren are blessed, 
because the barren will not bring children into this dreadful situation that awaits Jerusalem. A situation where they will see their children suffer and die before their very eyes. In language reminiscent of the apocalyptic discourse, Jesus continues, They will say to the mountains, Fall on us. This is an allusion to Hosea 10.8, which is an oracle of judgment against Israel. It is a desire for a quick death versus prolonged anguish. And to the hills, cover us, Jesus continues. Marshall sees this reference being a wish for an earthquake or similar convulsion to put the people out of their misery. So using apocalyptic imagery, Jesus tells the women that the current situation is nothing in comparison to what's coming. He concludes with a somewhat proverbial expression justifying his previous statements. Green wood does not burn as easily as dry wood. So if God has not spared the innocent Jesus, how much more severe will be the fate of the guilty Jerusalem? The two who were crucified with Jesus are now introduced. They're described as criminals. Again, guilt versus the innocent Jesus. One of these will later be seen as the good thief, who's given the name and tradition of Dismas. Thus, Luke may be following his typical style here of introducing in a minor position someone who will become significant. The arrival at the place of crucifixion is quick. Luke refers to it simply as the skull, rather than the place of the skull, which may, and makes no reference to the Aramaic Golgotha. Skull represents the Aramaic more accurately that place of the, than place of the skull. The third name of the place, Calvary, derives from the Latin for skull, Calvaria. The actual execution then is described in the simplest of language. There they crucified him. The reason is probably that the crucifixion was the most heinous form of execution. It's described by the Jewish historian Josephus as a, quote, most miserable death, unquote. It combined torture and slow asphyxiation caused by the inability to draw the body up and fill the lungs with air. Suspended on the cross, the weight of the body was on the arms. They were used to pull the torso up with the aid of the feet which pushed in order to fill the lungs with air and then lower the body to breathe out. As the arms and the legs became more and more tired, the more difficult breathing became and eventually death occurred. Luke specifies that the two criminals were also crucified on either side of Jesus who was in the middle. The division of the possessions of the condemned would naturally follow the crucifixion. Yet Luke interrupts the flow of that with a saying of Jesus. It is considered to be one of the seven last words of Christ. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Because this verse is not found in some of the key manuscripts of the Old Testament, some feel that it's a later addition. But the closeness of this phraseology to Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer, coupled with the emphasis on forgiveness so prevalent in Luke, and the image of Jesus as one who lives a life of virtue even to the end, seem to point to its authenticity. The focus then turns back to the soldiers, who now claim their just deserts in this. They were allowed to divvy up the personal effects of the condemned, and that was usually accomplished through the casting of lots. Ironically, that becomes a fulfillment of the 21st Psalm, where it says, They divide my garments among them, and for my raiment they cast lots. This is the first of several references to that psalm that will occur in the narrative. 
Luke reiterates the distinction between people and rulers now, noting that the people stood by watching. The rulers, on the other hand, scoff at him. Despite the fact that they have achieved what they set out to achieve, they still mock and scoff. He saved others. Let him save himself. There is a reminiscence here of the synagogue in Nazareth where Jesus mentions that they will quote to him the proverb, Physician, cure yourself. Jesus notes that it's not possible be that that was not possible because of their lack of faith. So also the mocking rulers here demonstrate their lack of faith. The irony is that through not saving himself, he will save others and thus prove that he is the Son of God, his chosen one. The soldiers then join in the mocking. They offer him sour wine, which is actually vinegar. This has been seen as a fulfillment of Psalm 69, 21, or Psalm 68, 22. In my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. The Greek word used for wine is not the usual oinos, but rather oxos, which designates a sharp, bitter wine, seen by some as the common wine of the soldiers. They continue in the same vein as the Jewish leaders, but their taunt is in the second person, directed toward Jesus. If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Their taunt is related to the inscription, which was placed over the head of Jesus to show the reason for his crucifixion. This is Jesus of this is the king of the Jews. Then the focus shifts to those crucified with Jesus. One would think that they might have some sympathy experiencing the same punishment as he does. One does and one doesn't, as it turns out. One of them railed at him. In other words, he spoke abusively to him. He repeats the mockery of the Jewish leaders. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. This criminal wants Jesus to use his powers, if indeed he really has any powers, to get them all out of this dreadful situation. The other, however, interrupts, rebuking the first, saying, Do you not fear God? This man realizes that there is something beyond the current situation. There is the judgment of Pilate which has led all three of them to this spot. But there is also the judgment of God, which demands that all three be answerable to God for their actions. In Pilate's mind now, all three are guilty. In regard to God, that's not the case. The one criminal reminds the other of that fact. You are under the same sentence of condemnation. We, indeed justly, are receiving the reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. He realizes that there is something radically different about the circumstances of Jesus and their circumstances. Having rebuked his fellow criminal, he turns to Jesus and makes a request. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Note, this second thief agrees with the first on Jesus as royal. But instead of making mocking fun of it, he appeals for compassion or forgiveness. Jesus' response is to grant his request. This day you shall be with me in paradise. So, because of his faith expressed here on the cross, this bandit, thief, or criminal has in the subsequent history of the church become known as Saint Dismas, a name first given to him in the apocryphal gospel known as the Gospel of Nicodemus. The Roman Martyrology places his feast on March 25th. 
Very little else is said concerning the events at the foot of the cross, or on the crosses. The focus immediately moves to the final moments of Jesus' life. Luke tells us that the time was about the sixth hour, 12 noon, and these final events take place at the ninth hour, 3 in the afternoon. Hence the tradition of the Traori, in which the crucifixion and death of Jesus are commemorated on Good Friday from 12 noon to 3 p.m. The death scene begins with the reference to the time, the sixth hour, as we said, 12 noon. It is then noted that there was darkness over the whole land until 3 p.m., or the ninth hour. Arnold comments that darkness was associated with the death of great men in both Greco-Roman and in Jewish tradition. The reason for the darkness is then given. The sun's light failed. But there's no explanation as to why this occurred. Some commentators suggest that an eclipse, which is not likely, occurred, or a sandstorm, which blocked the light of the sun. Others, looking on a more spiritual level, saw the darkness as a sign of the victory of the powers of evil. The next event is striking. The curtain of the temple was torn in two. This is the curtain which separates the holy place in the temple from the Holy of Holies. Thus the veil forms a barrier between God and his people, save the high priest once a year who enters on the Day of Atonement. Does this mean that as a result of the events now occurring, that that separation will be ended? Paul seems to think so in the second chapter of Ephesians. In the midst of these apocalyptic-like events, Jesus cries out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. This is a citation of Psalm 31, 6. Into your hand I commend my spirit, you have redeemed me, O Lord. The psalmist commends himself to the care of God in life. Jesus, here at the moment of his death, commits himself to to his father. Then the moment of death is recorded. Having said this, he breathed his last. The verb ex epnusen is from the verb ekpneo, meaning to breathe out, and hence the meaning becomes to expire, die, or breathe one's last. Jesus, as he has done in several places earlier in the Gospel, offered a prayer to the Father and then breathes his last. There are a number of reactions from various onlookers involved in the crucifixion. The first Luke notes is the centurion, who was in charge of carrying out the sentence of crucifixion. Witnessing what has just occurred, he's led to praise God and make a declaration. Certainly this man was innocent. Being a Roman, the centurion represents Pilate at the crucifixion. In here he reiterates the sentiment of Pilate that he has been expressing throughout the entire narrative, that Jesus is innocent. Luke differs slightly from Matthew and Mark here. In their narratives, the centurion declares Jesus to be a son of God. Here, he merely declares Jesus' innocence, or as the Greek word used connotes, his righteousness. Frank Madera has a very interesting take on this. He says, Jesus has shown through his righteous behavior that he, and not the Jewish leaders, is in right relationship with God, and that through his unwavering trust in God as Father to the end, Jesus has shown himself to be the Son of God. Next Luke notes the crowds who had assembled to witness what may be considered a victory now return to their homes beating their breasts. That throughout the biblical narrative is a sign of mourning with overtones here of guilt and contrition. In essence it expressed the fact that they see themselves as having done wrong. 
The verb return reinforces this. Since it has affinities to the Hebrew verb shuv, meaning to return, to turn back, or to repent. So the crowd departs is it a, in a penitential mood. Finally, the acquaintances of Jesus, who had all remained with him up to this final moment, are mentioned. Since Luke did not mention the abandonment of Jesus by the disciples in the garden, these acquaintances may be some of them. But in particular, the women who followed him from Galilee are mentioned. These women followed with Jesus and his disciples from Galilee to this very point and this very moment. They are at a distance watching the events play out. Thus, these women are witnesses to the crucifixion. And as we shall see next time, they will be the first witnesses to the resurrection. We shall leave the burial to the next session where we shall bring our discussion to the Gospel of Luke to a close. We'll look at the burial scene, the empty tomb narrative of Luke, and the Emmaus narrative, and the final commissioning of the apostles in the Lucan context. See you then.